Good evening and welcome. Good evening. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, so this is East Hampton Media's first mayoral debate. I'm Cassandra Holden and I'll be your moderator. I'd like to thank the candidate. I'd like to thank the candidates, uh, Joy Winnie and Nicole LaChapelle for joining us. And I'm delighted that you're here and taking part in the political process. We have a very exciting race, race this season. Um, for those of you who are uh, watching at home, uh, this event will be broadcast live on Charter, Chan Charter Channels 191 and 193. You can also check out East Hampton Media's Facebook page where the link to the live stream is there. You just click on that and you'll be able to follow this at home. So I'd like, I'd like to begin by introducing the candidates. Joy Winnie was raised in East Hampton and attended East Hampton Public Schools. She spent time with her grandparents, Lester and Hannah, <coughs> on Richardson's farm. She graduated from East Hampton High School in 1978. Soon thereafter, she wed William Winnie, to whom she has been married for 38 years. That's pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> Joy and Bill have two daughters, Amanda and Rebecca, as well as two... Heather. Amanda and Heather. Amanda and Heather, pardon <laughs> me, uh, as well as two granddaughters. Yep. Uh, Joy graduated from Holyoke Community College with an associate's degree in business administration in 1995. Beginning as a school bus driver and working her way up, in 2000, Joy was promoted to transportation supervisor for the Northampton Public Schools. She manages a budget of $1 million annually. Yep. Nicole has called East Hampton her home for 20 years. She served for a decade on the East Hampton Zoning Board of Appeals from 1999 until 2009, and as a member and vice chair of the board. From 2008 until earlier this year, she was a member of the Holyoke Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Committee and was named co-chair of the committee in 2015. She also previ previously served as the state appointee for the Hampshire County Regional Housing Authority from 2009 until 2010. Nicole has also served on the boards of the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts, Emerge Massachusetts, Massachusetts Association of Approved 766 Private Schools, and the Children's Museum in Holyoke. In 2011, the Massachusetts Commission of the, on the Status of Women honored her as an unsung heroine. She is a proud member of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee, serving as treasurer of the committee from 2013 until 2015. And she is a member of the Massachusetts Bar Association. A Holyoke native, Nicole graduated from Smith College with a Bachelor of Arts in Government and earned her JD from Western New England School of Law. Tonight's debate will be a modified Lincoln-Douglas format. The candidates will each give an opening two-minute statement. Following this, they will ask and respond to each other's questions. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer the question posed by the other, and then the candidate who posed the question will have one minute to respond to what has been said. Questions will be asked in an A-B order, going back and forth. The coin toss determined that Nicole will go first, and you can begin by reading your opening right. statement. I'd like to first thank um, Cassandra, as well as Kathy, East Hampton Media, Ryan, for putting this debate together and giving us both the opportunity to speak uh, to the people we both hope to represent, the voters and residents of East Hampton. I'd also like to thank uh, my family and all of my supporters that um, have cheered me on, but also given me great input and a special thank you to the supporters who are outside the building uh, tonight, uh, just honking and cheering. It was very inspiring. Thank you so much. I have called East Hampton my home for 20 years, and I chose to raise my daughter here. I want to be mayor to make sure that East Hampton stays a bright, safe, vibrant community where generations to come can also stay and raise a family, buy a home, start a business, because they choose to, because it is accessible to do so. Young and old, lifelong residents, as well as people who just moved into the city, 
folks of all races and creeds. We need to make sure that they experience the success that our city is experiencing now. And going forward, realizing that we are in a time of opportunity. Opportunity that we all must experience and take hold of and be a part of going forward. I thank you for your time tonight, and I look forward to having a great discussion with Joy about our priorities and visions for East Hampton as mayor. Thanks, Nicole. Joy? Thank you. I also would like to thank East Hampton Cable Television for sponsoring this event, and I welcome everyone here in the audience tonight. I am a lifelong resident of East Hampton, attending local public schools and graduating from East Hampton High School. Shortly after, I married my husband, Bill, and we have two daughters and one granddaughter, Emma, who is now attending East Hampton High School as a freshman. I'm running on a campaign platform that emphasizes experience, vision, and community. I was elected as a town meeting member in 1994 and elected to the city council in 1996. During my 21 year of tenure, I've run unopposed nine times. I've served nine years as vice president and two years as president of the city council. Committee assignments include finance, public safety, appointments, rules and government relations. Presently, I am the transportation supervisor for the Northampton Public Schools, where I do manage an annual budget of over a million dollars. My vision for East Hampton includes continuing to review and implement strategies outlined in the master plan and smart growth community checklist. If elected, I would love to move forward with a new community visioning process, which would include all members of our East Hampton community. I will look for incentives for manufacturing companies and small business startups to locate here and bring jobs to East Hampton. To lower our school choice assessment by promoting our public schools and providing our students with a first class education. I will continue to support redevelopment of One Ferry Street, Pleasant Street Mills, and 154 Everett Street. I will also continue to support the increased and increasing affordable housing units here in East Hampton and I will always be the protector of our water aquifer. Our sense of community is what makes East Hampton such a special place. To maintain our small town charm, I will continue to promote East Hampton as a welcoming destination. I look forward to, East, to our debate tonight and I would like to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Joy. Nicole, you may ask the first question. Great. Joy. Please describe the most difficult choice that you've had to make as a city councilor, something that required political courage. Hmm. Well, every choice that I have made in 21 years on the city council has at one time or another been a very difficult choice. Not any one stands out in my mind when people come to the city council with uh, an idea and they want something done quickly, it is not always done quickly. Mm -hmm. It has to go through the process. And I'm a very open-minded person, so I don't make my decisions on a first see, first come type of thing. One of the more difficult decisions I think that we've overcome and had to deal with are some of the zoning issues that we've been presented. Uh, but then again, providing information from our planning board and our ordinance subcommittee who have do their homework and uh, moving forward, um, I think that all of the decisions that we've made have been good, sound decisions. So I really can't think of a difficult one that comes to mind only because they all can be difficult depending on what the passionate um, issue is. Thank you. Nicole, would you like to respond? Was there one of those decisions that you made it that really you had to step forward and know that you might have a very intense pushback, either from your colleagues on the city council or members of the planning board as you were a part of a decision-making uh, process. Uh, something that you knew the next day you would be asked about and questioned about how or why you made that decision. Mm. 
one of the ones that comes to mind is when we did the rezoning and it included rezoning my own property up on Hoyoke Street and Mountain. Um, we had a lot of residents, old time residents, um, that were very adversarial about the decision of moving the properties from an R40 to an R80, putting a lot of their properties in a non-conforming property zone, which included my own. Um, I made the decision because it was the right decision to go with the R80, which then put even my own property into a non-conforming lot. Uh, and so when I had to go to the residents who were very upset about that decision, I basically had to say it, it was a decision that had to be made, putting aside any of my own prejudices, and that was probably one of the hardest decisions I had to make. Thank you, Joy. It's now your turn to ask a question of Nicole. So Nicole, um, opioid substance use disorder in a community, in our community, is, is at this point a public health crisis. Public safety officials report that they use Narcan to revive somebody in East Hampton on an average of at least once a week. How would you as mayor approach this epidemic to help families and community members who are in crisis? I think approaching this health crisis around addiction and opioids is one, uh, it starts as a whole community discussion. And something I'm very familiar with, um, leading school programs, but also organizations that face these exact issues as families and individuals. I would look to our public safety departments, uh, but also our district attorney, who has done some very good work in this area, as well as pulling in our medical providers and looking at more treatment within our community, making it very easy for families to get their, their support and the facts they need in treatment, but as well as people who are struggling with the addiction. I think a part of two very important public partners uh, could come in is Hoyoke Medical Center, but also working with Valley Medical, which is right in our city. I think there are some great examples out there that we could bring into East Hampton, but also examples in programming that we can learn for, from that have not been as effective as we anticipated. Thanks, Nicole. Joy, would you like to respond? Well, we've just partnered with Hampshire Hope, and we will share in the $1.7 million grant. Mm -hmm. The grant will provide support services not only to the individual who is in crisis, but also the family who has to support that individual. The grant money will also supply our fire and police and our first responders with Narcan, which is, um, as everybody knows, very expensive and not always available. So I will absolutely support the program and the partnership that we've developed, and I would love to lo look forward working with Hampshire Hope and our public safety people in hopefully expanding that program so that it becomes more accessible to all of our families. Thank you. Nicole? Joy, we've all been alarmed by the situation at East Hampton High School around diversity and student safety. The superintendent conducted an internal investigation and released a report. But the attorney general, a third party, also conducted an investigation and released her own report that painted a very different picture. What are your thoughts on the discrepancies between those two reports and how do we let our students and our parents know that East Hampton High School is safe? Well, I read all of the reports just as you did and I did meet with the superintendent and uh, I was there when she came out with her 10-point plan which she went into the memorandum of agreement with the Attorney General's office. Um, but I think what's being lost in all of this discussion is that the Attorney General, once the agreement was signed, um, wrote a letter to the superintendent and to the school committee congratulating them on their openness to the process, for their cooperation, for the steps that they took to partner with different organizations to bring in anti-bias training to all of the personnel all of the teachers, 
and now going down to the students at the high school and the middle school level. This is going to be an issue that needs to involve the parents as well as the full community. Bias is not something that is born in people. It is a taught issue. And mm -hmm. people need to come to terms with that. And we can only do that as a community moving forward with the positive reinforcement that we are doing everything in our power to keep our children safe in their school. Thank you, Joy. Nicole, would you like to respond? Yeah, I didn't realize, um, I was at the meeting when uh, the superintendent presented the 10-point plan. And I remember in that meeting, uh, she had stated that she did not have the information from the, eternal, the Attorney General. Um, when that report came out the very next day, I was stunned and blindsided by the disparity, especially around suspension which means exclusion from the learning environment, as well as the different types of discipline based on what your, your ethnicity was between white and non-white students. I commend the school committee and the superintendent and the city council for all of their work. But what I am concerned about, and I was concerned about that night and I continue to be, is that the issue effect one group of our community more than any other, and that's the students. And I wonder where their voices are in this plan. Thanks, Sorry Nicole. Joy, it's now your turn to ask a question. Okay. So your website, Nicole, says, quote, we must harness our resources to invest in our future and fight adequate funding so our children can receive the quality education they deserve. Can you please explain to the taxpayers of East Hampton your position on school choice and why you made the decision to choice your child out of East Hampton when you were a resident? Absolutely. And I'm happy to clear up any confusion on that. When I moved into East Hampton in 1997, uh, my daughter had just entered school and I had just started on a new career path that was very challenging and promised great economic um, promise for our family. The key for picking Sigrid's, my daughter's school, had to do with before and after care, but also a structure that she would thrive in as I started a career that would be 10 and 12 hours a day all throughout Western Massachusetts. I was very fortunate to have the village of Hilltown Cooperative Charter School, but also my family and my friends who would help me pick up Sigrid and get her to her after school care. I think that demonstrates the options that we need in this city while we strengthen our school district, but also it's confusing, I'm sure to many of you, of how I can so staunchly be for public schools and have spent 20 years working to the betterment of public schools while making that personal choice. I respect people who make choices based on their individual child and situation. I certainly love the option, but would like to see East Hampton Public Schools partner with agencies outside of the city and inside of the city to give more options to parents and growing families. So choice or church school is a lesser, uh, is a lesser desirable option. Thank you. Joy, would you like to respond to that? Well, so our school choice assessment from this year for money going out of East Hampton was $2.1 million this past year. Uh, I will plan to work with the school community to promote dual enrollment, technology, tiny tots program, and creative electives in our high school. We have an award-winning music program that starts at the elementary school and goes right through to the high school. The program must be supported. Arts in our schools is a vital piece of, of uh, thing that a children must attend to and they must participate in if all possible. Um, we also have the elementary uh, program, the Champions After School program, and I will work hard with the school committee to create before and after school programs because I do know that parents are challenged going to work for seven and getting out at three. Thank you. 
Nicole, the next question goes to you. I think it's clear that both Joy and I have a deep respect and commitment to strengthening our public schools. Um, that said, I'd like to just shift to another important part of being mayor and the executive of our city by asking you what do you believe the greatest needs and challenges facing our local business community right now? And as mayor, what would you do to help them? Well, I'm a very big proponent of the master plan. I'm a very big proponent of our Economic and Development Industrial Commission. They meet all the time. They come up with some very good, valuable ideas, and they stick with the community development plan that we have in place. I would absolutely support that, and I would be very vocal in advocating for small businesses, startup businesses, and industrial businesses to come into East Hampton. We still have lots of room down on Pleasant Street for expansion. We have lots of room for companies to come in. There are opportunities for incentives for these companies to come in through our planning department. So I would be very, very, very active in doing that, as well as partnering with our local governments around the area and sistering with them and uh, any programs that come down the road, either federally or state funded. Thank you. Nicole, would you like to respond to that? I think the commitment to the master plan, as well as our open space plan, is very commendable, and it's key to East Hampton's future. As someone who has started and grown uh, several small businesses, when I've worked with different communities, it is very important as I look forward to placing a business or starting a business in a community that I understand not only where there might be space today for a business, but also where will that business be in five and ten years? Will it be sustainable? I think working with the planning department is key in following the smart growth approaches. I don't think that every opportunity business-wise should automatically find a place in East Hampton. I think it is a comparison to our master plan, working with the planning department, the city engineer, to look forward to fill our remaining open space, which is very tight, with the best long-term small businesses and medium-sized businesses to complement the existing businesses we have. Thanks, Nicole. Joy, now it's your turn to ask a yeah, question. Yeah, so, oh, it's my turn to ask, okay. Yes. So, Nicole, mm -hmm. under the arts and creative economy on your website, you mentioned that East Hampton must be proactive in marketing communications and recruitment uh, to better support our growing arts community. And from my conversations with the East Hampton Community Arts Committee members, they do seem pleased with the city's the support, always asking what more can we do. So what is your plan and how do you propose to fund it? I think we start with supporting the existing artists and others in a creative line of business or have a job but have arts as a second income, a second hobby that has now blossomed into something uh, that we might see on the walls of City Hall or in our galleries. To pay for it, I think it is the time for East Hampton and ECA Plus to partner and look outward to partnerships with area museums, with partnerships with our federal and state agencies. I don't think that those funds necessarily to improve the supports for our creative economy to come out of East Hampton's budget, but looking how to augment those dollars with public and private partnerships starting first with the artists who have chosen to be here and stay here. Thank you. Joy, would you like to respond to that? Yes. So I am committed to keeping the salary for the East Hampton Community Arts Coordinator in the 2018-19 budget. I know that a lot of people have approached me about that because it was uh, funded through a grant program and through the city. Uh, but I feel that it's an important position that keeps our very vibrant and active arts community in the forefront of the economic development that's surrounding our very vibrant and active arts community. Uh, it's important that we foster them and that we help them grow as 
they have just blossomed in the city of mm -hmm. East Hampton. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Nicole, you may ask a question. Related to the, the place of arts in our local economy and also our community, Joy, I wonder, within this environment, the economy and variables are always shifting. Literally, we could wake up tomorrow and read the paper and find something has dramatically changed. It's happened a couple of times in the last year or so. What value do you place on the relationships at the state and federal level, as well as regional partners? And what's your view on taking a more regional approach to protecting East Hampton's economy and culture? Oh, I, I'm always for regionalization. We just, uh, we just regionalized for, um, uh, with this, the town of Southampton um, for a conservation commission uh, person now to be put in that position. That's very valuable. I'm, I'm all about regionalization. And there's no reason why any of us should have to go out and reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. The wheel is there. Um, if somebody already has a program in place, um, then we should try to figure out ways where we can sister on to it, not reinvent it, and access some of their uh, initiatives by being collaborative with each other. I, that can happen at the state, the local, and the county level. Um, I'm from the past of the Hampshire County Cogs, which unfortunately has gone by the wayside uh, because it wasn't servicing everybody in the district. But the whole premise of working together as a county, numbers and voices, is yeah. a very good one. So if we could just collaborate with our surrounding communities, and especially those that have the bigger grants, um, and they let us in, then yeah, I'm all for it, absolutely. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I, I again uh, agree with what uh, Joy has said and has based that on her deep history um, sitting as a public servant in this very room. Uh, my concern and what I would bring to the table is that federal and state money is based on relationships that come down to bigger communities with bigger grants, that come into the regional economic development councils. I have had decades of experience working with those federal and state partners. Members of our federal delegation, as well as governors, state senators, and state reps. I know Beacon Hill, and I know DC, and I know how to go down there and bring money back, and worked very hard on school-based initiatives to have that happen, as well as with the Children's Museum and the Massachusetts Approved Association of Private Schools. I think it's what East Hampton really needs to fund the regional programs that Joy mentioned. Um, it's a key part to help our, our cultural community, but also small businesses, and balance out our economy so when things do change, we can respond. Thank you. Can I answer back? Do I get that? No? We're done? She okay. asked and then you responded. Okay. Then. Right, but you done. get to ask another question. So you could ask a related one if you'd like to. So Nicole, um, what process will you follow to prioritize, formulate, and execute East Hampton's municipal budget? And we'll go back to the, the grassroots here. Well, I would, as mayor and as a leader executive in our community, I would take advantage of the amazing retention and history of the employees and departments in this building and listen very carefully to our finance director and our planner, sit down with department heads and talk about their priorities. Each department has a special, a special focus and know their area of government, but also their expertise. A mayor can't claim to be uh, all-knowing and starts with conversations in the community as well. I think that there's a larger conversation to have based on the master plan and pulling in our department heads. As a mayor, I have to make tough choices. I have to figure out what is going to be cut based on the state and federal money that we get. I would never do that without deep conversations with my department heads, as well as stakeholders in the community. Would you so, like to respond to that? Oh yeah. So, 
the current process and the process that has been developed when Michael Tausnick was the mayor in East Hampton that I was uh, privy to when I was first uh, elected in 1996 and on the, um, the uh, budget committee is that East Hampton begins with each department head developing their own budget um, by prior prioritizing their needs and their fixed costs. Um, they then send it to the mayor and the mayor and the finance director will meet with each department head and they will then go through their department line item by line item and once all of the departments have presented their budget, the mayor will then put together a balanced budget to present to the city council because the city council does get the ultimate approval of the budget. But the most important part, thing, part of this whole process is to present a balanced budget to the city council that is within the taxpayers' new, new growth and the formula that is put together. Thank you. Nicole, you may ask a question. And this is our last question, right? We're doing five? <clears throat> okay, just checking. Oh, just time has flown. Um, Joy, on a lighter note, um, my last question uh, would be uh, serious, but one that interests me greatly. What's one quality about me you admire? And what's one piece of constructive criticism about me you would offer? That's good. I mean, come on, it's been serious. So, like, we need, you know, lighten it up, right? You're tenacious. Very good. I admire that. I admire that. Uh, I also admire your ability to speak the way that you do. I sometimes stumble over my words, and that's okay. We both get our messages out. The one quality that I is that dislike is that what you have constructive, constructive criticism thank you uh, I'll take what I can get but you know I just wasn't sure how I was gonna play to the TV audience <laughs> so the only constructive criticism and I don't like to criticize people I I usually like to bolster people up in the fact that maybe I don't agree with the way that you do things mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in the end we could come to some kind of coming together and mm -hmm. meeting each other halfway. So I'm not quite sure where you are with that, but we will move on and we will figure that out. Very good. Well said. Very good. Fair enough. Yes. Nicole, would you like um, to respond to that? Well, I, I, would, um, I would start with kind of answering my own question about you. Um, I respect greatly uh, your experience on the city council, your knowledge of East Hampton, but also, like I made a choice to, to stay in East Hampton, you also made a choice to be born and raised and stay in a community, and I think that's very commendable. Um, as far as a constructive criticism, I would want to see um, or hope in any relationship that we have, and I have experienced it with you in, in the past, but in government, and if you were mayor, um, an ability to take a fresh look at things. East Hampton has very solid and straightforward protocols, but the world is changing. Money and streams of money are changing. The arts community that didn't exist 10 years ago exists now, and we have to look at that. Yeah. All right, Absolutely. thank you to both of you. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Closing? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. No. Um, so Joy, you, you go first. With oh, your okay. So tonight, tonight has been an opportunity for all of us to learn more of where we as candidates stand on different issues facing the city of East Hampton. I'm optimistic that our grant partnership with Hampshire Hope will help provide support services needed to combat our opioid crisis. I'm confident that working with the department heads and the finance director, I will be able to successfully execute the city's budget. I am committed to putting together a task force to study funding for a teen center to benefit our youth. And I'm determined to keep an East Hampton Community Arts Coordinator in the budget next year as this is key to keeping our arts community active and contributing to our economic development. 
I will continue to review and implement the 25 strategies outlined in the master plan and the smart growth community checklist and the community development strategy plan. I am excited to reopen the visioning process and welcome East Hampton community members to join me in shaping the future of our community for the next 10, 15, and 20 years. I will work with the Board of Public Works to seek additional revenue to possibly supplement our Chapter 90 funds for enhancing our roads. In 21 years of service to this city, I have always handled all city matters ethically and with integrity. And I have always respected the city councilors and the mayors and everybody else I have worked with. And I am proud of that. I would like to thank everyone here for the opportunity to participate in this debate. I would look forward to working with everyone as mayor and to lead East Hampton forward over the next two years. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole? I also would like to start with thanking um, Cassandra for mediating uh, for the group East Hampton Media. Um, I'd also like to thank the people in this room as well as those who are watching on TV and live streaming Facebook uh, for taking the time out of your day, at the end of a day, uh, to listen and to participate by uh, watching the conversation that Joy and I have had tonight, and I look forward to continuing. On June 20th, I stood on the steps of Old City Hall and I announced my candidacy for mayor of East Hampton. On that day, I promised I would go into the community and knock on doors and talk to people. And indeed, I have hundreds of doors and had a lot of conversations with folks about their hopes and their struggles and their concern for our city. The one thing that I took away from so many conversations there was that listening is so important. Listening to members of our community, all over our community and city. But just as important as listening is responding. East Hampton needs somebody who will respond. East Hampton needs a mayor that will be decisive and take on tough challenges and make tough decisions. We want our community to be as whole as it possibly can be in the face of a lot of challenges and diversity. I am a leader. I've been a leader my whole career in schools, in private businesses, not-for-profits, and I am proud of that. And I'm proud of making the tough decisions I did, listening and responding. And certainly this process has made me even more aware of just how important that is in the leadership process. Today, I'm asking you for the privilege to lead, because leading is a privilege, and it's a great, great responsibility. And I would like the privilege to be your mayor of East Hampton, and also a partner with you in going forward together, knowing that as your mayor, I will take those tough stances. I will fight for more resources, but also to maintain the very best that East Hampton has shown over the last decade. Thank you again, and I look forward to continuing the conversation and would encourage you to go to the speakeasy um, up the street at the Brass Cat. Yes. Thanks, Thank Nicole. You. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for joining us, as she mentioned. <laughs> Brass Cat. Join us there at 8.30 for follow-up conversation.